if you want to increase inflation, then of course you should raise interest rates. If you increase the interest rates, that means that the government has to pay the bondholders more money because they pay more interest. So that's a transfer of money or creation of money better. It's a creation of money that goes from the public sector to the private sector. So the pensioners or those holding the government bonds can spend more money. And then there's also the, the forward pricing channel. So if the interest rate is 5% next year in the UK, you can get a risk-free 5% from your government by investing in government, government bonds. So other asset prices also have to deliver 5% interest rates. So the most easiest way to do, deliver a 5% interest is that the price of, of something goes up by 5% so that you have an increase in your income from owning that asset. So this is the MMT explanation. And historically, you can see that normally high interest rates go together with high rates of inflation and then low interest rates go together with low rates of inflation. <laughs> This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron-only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And we're delighted to welcome back to the MMT podcast, economist, author and friend of the show, Dr. Dirk Entz. Dirk, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hi. I thought to kick things off uh, because it gives us an opportunity to talk about something core to MMT. Uh, I thought we could talk about coverage of something that's happening to UK state pensions here. Um, so in 2010, our conservative Lib Dem coalition government made a promise to pensioners uh, known as the triple lock on pensions. And this guarantees that the state pension will be upgraded by either 2.5% or by the rate of inflation or by the rise in the level of earnings recorded in July for the previous year, whichever of those three things is highest. So because of the way COVID affected the statistics, lower income people just lost their jobs and went on benefits and higher wage earners retained their jobs. So that meant that the average level of earnings jumped up. So just to emphasize, it's not a booming economy, but a statistical quirk, which caused this particular measurement to increase. But so if the conservatives remain true to their triple lock promise, that should mean that pensions uh, go up by 8%. Some people are saying 7%. Now, it would seem that even the nominally progressive press over here have got it in for pensioners. So the Independent has summed all this up under the headline, pension set to soar through £10,000 a year, Mark, unless Rishi Sunak suspends the triple lock. And even towards the end of that article, they concede Quote, even if the state pension was to increase by 8%, it would still leave a £730 a year income gap compared to the Joseph Roundtree Foundation's minimum income standard of £10,816, according to new analysis by the financial services firm Just Group. So the fact that the UK government has decided to guarantee our seniors a below poverty level of existence, even if the 8% increase comes off, that's in the back end of the article in small print and in the large print, we've got words like soaring and generous. So this is basically given the conservatives the space to float the idea of watering down this already inadequate triple lock 
promise. So the telegraph of some day under the headline, Tory policy that guarantees to raise state pension will be altered after ministers decide that 7% increase would be unaffordable. Now, applying the MMT lens to all of this, why is this coverage frustrating to read for people who <laughs> understand how the government actually spends? Yeah, well, it's frustrating because we know that the, the state is the currency issuer and as a currency issuer, you can just uh, you can just spend money into existence. So there, there is no. It doesn't make sense, for example, to talk about expenditures as costs to the government. It's not costs. Um, it's it's just money that you can spend into existence. So the the Bank of England can can provide those funds by by um, um, in, increasing the accounts of the banks that receive the money for their clients, and that's all there is to it. So by now we have some some papers about how this actually works so at the bank of england for example when the government spends they they charge the consolidated fund and then they increase the paymaster general drawing account and that means that um, some institution within the government can use the government banking service to to make payments and that's all there is to it so so to make payments it means that, that then the government service which is spending the money can just then direct the Bank of England to, to increase the bank account of some, some bank. And that bank then increases the, the bank account of some firm or some, some private person. And, and through this, inserts reserves into the system in, in British pounds. And MMT stresses that this is like a monopoly on, on the currency. So you are the price setter. You can you can set the wages, but you can also set the pensions, for example. So there's, there's no economic problem in just increasing the the pensions that you pay by eight percent um it's it's not a problem it, it might be a political problem because uh, of course some people might think that it's unfair um but then again i don't think that pensioners in the uk um are, are comparatively rich Com um, when you look at countries like austria probably the uk pensioners are worse off um german pensioners are also kind of uh, worse off than austrian pensioners um, but yeah, I mean, it's a political decision. And of course, you shouldn't hide be behind this kind of language, which is kind of pretending that the government works just like a normal household budget. So that if, if you want to increase spending, then somehow you're, you're going into debt or somehow the others have to pay it with, with their taxes, kind of funding it. Um, that's, of course, this kind of myth, the deficit myth, as Stephanie Kelton calls it. Um, that is operating inside the Eurozone, but also in the UK. I just hope that someday people will understand MMT and th understand that this is a political decision, uh, how the government sets prices, including the pensioners' pensions. Can we dig a little bit more into the political decision that is being made here? Because I am pretty sure that the, the people who do have private savings are not the ones going to be sort of uh, the, the most affected is going to be people who are completely reliant on state pension and therefore who have spent most of their lives earning either a minimum income or close to a minimum income. What is the objective <laughs> with, um, I mean, I, I completely understand with, with the, their desire to lower minimum wage and make, you know, make workers worse off or, 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 or shift power to the side of, of, of capital, say. But when it comes to pensioners, is, is the intention really to, to have pensioners, you know, actively look for work? I'm not sure what the intention is. Um, I think that it's probably a problem of, of perceived unfairnessness. So, so I think that probably the politicians are afraid that an increase in pensions by, by 8% is perceived as, as unfair to, to many others, uh, groups that include the, the working people. Um, so they probably would, would not like it to, to see pensioners' uh, uh, incomes increase by 8% and their own wages do not increase by, by this amount or by this percentage. But I'm I'm not sure what what pensioners are supposed to do if if they have very low pensions. Well, I think that probably the the politicians don't don't really care about them. They, it's just the dogma that because you think of the government's budget as a household budget, you just try to cut expenditures. Um, and maybe there's nothing personal. Maybe it's just that that this kind of dogma is is so ingrained in these politicians that they they never think about the actual decisions and how it affects people. I think it's probably dogma. It's just that that they they don't want to see 
uh, I think they call it in an article by The Guardian, they called it windfall profits, more or less, or windfall pensions. And, and that's something which seems to point in the direction of, of a problem with, with unfairness. At least there's now a, a discussion about, about pensions and, and by how much to increase them. So, so that is maybe something which is good. It's puzzling to me because um, uh, the reason why I mention it, sorry, is a little bit off, off of the beat with economics. But we, I've seen that attitude, and I'm sure you have seen th that as well, Christian, when, when, I mean, with nurses' pay, you had um, uh, quite a few people who you'd imagine would be you know who who are not high earners actually say well if if i'm suffering financially then they should suffer as well and or or in america we see that with um i think student is it student loans you know if i had to pay my debt then they shouldn't they their debt shouldn't be cancelled and I don't know where that comes from. I don't. <laughs> I think it might be from, as, as we're saying, from that belief that you know my my will, um, there will be incomes at the expense of my well being. That that it's quite damaging and quite divisive. What do you think? I think the they definitely go to the. Um, it's going to cost the government too much, just like the Telegraph did. Um, and I imagine the Telegraph, that's the sort of conservative leaning paper, Dirk, in case you didn't know, over here. And, and th they've, you know, they've couched it in terms that the increase would be unaffordable so that the government's going to run out of money, that, that false situation that they've presented there. And, and I think when they do that, it, it's because they know, like, morally, we should be provisioning seniors at a higher level. Uh, so there could only be one reason for not doing that and and that is the government's going to run out of money and and um you know like we say often that MMT takes that off the table tell us that it's going to create an inflation problem maybe we can talk <laughs> okay how how's it going to create inflation but it's not going to cause a default problem no. um so you know and, and and yeah in terms of that moral uh, a hazard thing, I guess, for want of a better word, where, I mean, Warren's uh, said it more than a few times about like, that there's this idea that, oh, if the pension's generous, then younger people are going to not work as hard or not have any ambition because they know they're going to have, <laughs> you know, have a nice life when they reach pensionable age. I, again, it, it doesn't really Yeah, that make makes sense. sense. You know, they can starve now. <laughs> and then, and then when you apply it to student debt, there's also that talking point of like, well, you know, we could abolish slavery. <laughs> Um, but there were, that would be unfair to all the slaves in, in years gone by that didn't have <laughs> slavery abolished while they were slaves. So no, I think there's there's something there. I mean, it's it's about human nature, and we we think it's it's something is unfair if if we have to do something which is somehow bad and we don't want to do it, and then the next generation doesn't have to do it. Um, we don't like that as as voters as as human beings as as maybe also as parents or as as grandfathers or mothers um so i i think you have a point there so so that's why why change is so slow because because, because people say it, it worked for us why should you change that and and even if it's a bad thing they they still say it it didn't work for us, so why would you, why would you want yeah. to change that? <laughs> okay, so so it maybe it didn't work, but it it helped us to build character or something. Um, so so they come up with these strange arguments at, in order to not change. If you survive, it helped build you into this character that re wants to perpetuate this unfair thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a massive success in character building that cruelty was. There's also maybe a bit of of social Darwinism in the background. Um, that that people think that in order to get ahead you have to you have to suffer, okay? And this is a very strong idea. It's also connected in many cases with this psychological idea of of having a strict father figure um, behind you. So so you have to to yeah you have to behave yourself and you have to do as others tell you, and only then you can you can, you, are, you should become rich. This is something which which also has, is connected to this moral hazard story. That you're you're supposed to suffer in order to to get ahead, <laughs> and if you don't right. suffer but you get ahead, then there's some moral hazard problem. Uh, there's something wrong with with the world. Maybe 150 years ago, you could have made the argument because we had these inventors, and they were often these kind of 
people who, who were tinkerers and they, they sat alone in the workshop and they invented something. But if you look at, at research and development today, there's huge bureaucracies at multinational corporations and they do the research. So, so there's, there's no way that you can say, for example, that, that I don't know, some, some entrepreneur uh, did, did this or did that. No, it was like, like thousands of people who, who worked um, over maybe three continents in, in five subsidiaries and they worked for, for maybe three years and that's, that's now the outcome. So the product is the outcome of all this in innovation um, and maybe some inventions, um, but it's, it's very, it's very, yeah, it, it's a bureaucratical process with, which involves a lot of planning. So, so of course, you have on this one hand this kind of myth of the entrepreneur as, as somebody who takes risks and gambles and is very dynamic. But if you look at reality, there's huge bureaucracies, and then they they don't like risks, for example, and so they they sponsor more than one enterprise so that they they will win anyway. So I think there's there's a huge gap between reality here and and the the mythology mythology that is built around the the entrepreneur as a kind of generic type of, of person. Our friend um, Corey Doctorow highlighted on his blog this week that next month Berliners will vote in a referendum to force Germany's largest publicly traded landlords to sell 240,000 homes to the state, whereupon those homes will become publicly owned housing. Now, that sounds like a good idea to me, uh, Dirk, but um, can you tell us about that? Yeah, the actual Berlin government, which we have, is um, is a government of the, of the left. So there are three parties which are of the left, and, and they have... Um, they, they had this idea of creating a rent ceiling. So they said, okay, um, roughly speaking, if you, if you, ha if you live in a flat in Berlin and it's not a new one, um, there's the maximum amount of money that you can pay per, squ per square meter is, I don't know, it's, it's rough. It's close to nine euros, for example, for, for modernized buildings, which are, which are in good neighborhoods, let's say. So everybody who pays more than nine euros can, per square meter can cut down uh, the bill to, to nine euros per square meter. Um, and, well, that was, of course, quite something because rents were, were rising and, and some people would have saved maybe 500 euros a month. Um, so the politicians did this and then they, they cut the rents. But the, the Landlords Association, they went to the German Constitutional Court and said that, on a on a state level, you are not allowed to do this, which is a technical or a legal problem more, more than anything else. So, so they would say it's okay if the German federal government did it, um, but that's not the case. So, so you are not allowed to do that if you are just a state government. And then the constitutional court said, oh, yes, that's that's true. Um, so we have to reverse, or the Berlin government has to reverse this decision. So now the rents have, have basically risen again to, to where they have been before. And the difference has to be paid by those people who are renting. So that, of course, means um, or the, the, the rent control here, they, it, would have, it would have lasted for five years. So if your, if your rent would have gone down something like maybe 270 or, or 300 euros per, per month, then, of course, over five years, it would have been 15,000 euros. Okay, so the price of a small car. Or a medium-sized car, even. Um, so that was quite a significant amount of money. But after after this, this was beaten down by the constitutional court, um, there was this um, referendum on on whether to to force these uh, or this one company, uh, Deutsche Wohnen. So it's in English, it would be German Living. Um, so to force it to sell its houses and flats uh, to to the Berlin government, and it was kind of popular before. But after the uh, the, the con rent control was was uh, kicked out by the constitutional court, uh, it became really popular, and a lot of people were frustrated and and thought, well, uh, the constitutional court's decision cost me upwards of ten thousand euros. So now, because I'm I'm not a good loser, <laughs> I f I vote for for this proposition uh, and and force this private company to sell all their houses and flats in Berlin for a cheap price. And um, I think it was a third of, of the people in Berlin who agreed with this kind of proposition um, before this happened. And then after it happened, so after the German constitutional court decided that it's, it's unlawful to, to stop rents from rising, uh, now there's a, there's a small majority who says, yes, we, we should do this. 
Um, and that, of course, is, is a very interesting development. So, so first, the landlords have been very happy with the, with the decision. Um, but of course, it, the decision has, has reduced political space um, because in a democracy, you should be allowed to, to talk about prices, to talk also about rents. And, and if you think there should be a maximum rent, well, why not? Um, so, I mean, one way to get it would be to have this on the federal level. But the Christian Democrats are the strongest party and they would never ha- allow it. So, so that's off the table on the, at the federal level. And, and that is why if you want to do something, you have to do it on the state level. So the referendum will, will take place uh, with the German federal elections in September. So it's going to be roughly a month and, and a week maybe away from, from now. And we'll see what the outcome is. And you think uh, the people will vote yes to this idea? Yeah. I mean, the, the corona pandemic has shown that, that the rich got richer even faster than before the pandemic. And, and people saw that. And people saw that, that they, they suffered a lot from unemployment. Even those people on, on furlough schemes say they had less income. Um, and, and the price of, prices of rents uh, went on, the par- prices of real estate went up, rents went up. So, so these are windfall profits. And, and nobody in politics was, was talking about curbing those windfall profits. So just as they talk about curbing the windfall benefits for pensioners in the UK, nobody, nobody in Germany said we have to curb the windfall profits uh, from those companies who, who made billions during the pandemic. Um, and people, people are, I mean, they have some kind of sense, sense of fairness and they, they, they feel like, like they have been betrayed. <laughs> by the joint institutional court um, and this, they want they want their voice heard and and they want to say look there's a problem with the rents it's it's too much and and we we can afford it but it will take away a lot of money from us and and then we have problems buying the other stuff that we would like to buy so so please fix this and and as i said politicians try to fix it by having this this maximum rent or ceiling rent rent ceiling i think it was called um, and now we have this political struggle, and I, I do think that Berlin is in Berlin. You have a lot of people who are renting, so it affects quite a lot of people. And and you you can you can calculate what you lost because of the constitutional court's decision. So so that is something which which is very very close to to the voters' um, interests. So so they they know that they lost some money, and and they want to see somebody else to to suffer too. The Financial Times editorial board is critical of the idea, um, writing, quote, it will not, however, solve the underlying problem, a lack of house building and relatively low wage growth over the past few decades. Tackling these problems, not only in Germany, but elsewhere, is the key to fixing housing markets, end quote. Now, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, the market had 10, day, 10 years to, to fix the housing problems, and, and it didn't, and it, it, it will never do, because um, it's, it's only, there's only real estate construction for the rich in, in Berlin. So around the street from here, there's, there's a corner, which is not a, it's not a especially nice corner, and there's, there's a new building. It was built maybe three or four years ago. And they sold a flat for with 100 square meters and two very tiny balconies. Um, they so, they sold that the asking price was 899,000 euros, which is probably roughly 800,000 pounds. And that's not even the best part of Berlin. Um, so so nobody can afford it. So um, they're building for the millionaires. You can only afford a flat with that price if you are a millionaire, a pound millionaire or, or euro millionaire doesn't matter. And and that's what the market does. So you, you you shouldn't expect from the market that the market is providing something for for people who have very little money. I mean that's not how a market works. If if you get your microeconomics right, I mean microeconomics says if you have money you can buy stuff. If you don't have money you can. So the problem is that of course because of all the inequality, there's lots of people who have very little income, which also means that their their pensions will be very low. So so in Germany and I guess it's the same in the UK. Part of the pensions problem is that people earn very little money in the last couple of decades, and there's, there's loads of them, so, so they don't qualify for, for a high pension. Um, and yeah, the market, as I said, the market had, has had 10 years to do it, 
And I think it's clear that they never will. So we have to revert to a solution where the government is providing us with, with housing, adequate housing. Um, I think Vienna in Austria is the, the prime example. Um, they built lots of, of com communal housing um, so that I, I think they, they rent it out. They have a buffer stock of flats in, in every part of the town. And I think they, they ask for seven euros, which is roughly probably six pounds 20 or something uh, per, per square meter. Um, so, so that is reasonably cheap. Uh, I heard from an expert who said that to maintain a flat, you pay about three euros fifty uh, per per square meter per year. So everything else is is profit. It's pure profit. Um, and of course, it's it's not fair. So you could say, okay, maybe you can get a, a euro or two if you if you rent out a flat uh, above the 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 costs of of maintenance. Um, but but to have a flat. Which is rented out at fifteen or twenty euros per square meter. I mean, that's that's really windfall profits. So the entrepreneur or the the house owner here, it's not an entrepreneur. Uh, so the house owner just it's just he's just holding the house, not doing anything. Okay, and then why should that person receive more and more money? Um, that doesn't make sense. Um, so I, I think it, the time is over to look for for market solutions. Um, as I said, it's it's clear that the market can it cannot work if if people don't have enough money to to afford houses so the market will tell you sorry come back when you have more money um but but that's not a solution you can't you can't have lots of people who have no houses and, and never will be um able to afford one so what you you will get in the end is, is kind of i mean like in the us they have these trailer parks i mean that's that's what could happen Maybe if if you're a bit posh, you can call it a tiny house. Um, but <laughs> yeah, the social problem behind this is is, is is yeah, it's a social problem, and and it needs to have a solution, and not a cynical solution. So so real solution. So so the government, I, I guess it has the government has to jump in there, and as MMT always stresses, at the state level you have to you have to talk about money because the state level the the system is a little different, and you have to finance your spending, and there's, there's debt ceilings and all of that. But yeah, you you would have to spend a lot of money, and and that you have to make sure that the resources are there. In Berlin, you are, would have to rezone, for example. So you you would have to to make available more land, especially in the periphery of of the city, and to build more more public transport, for example. But but it would be possible. All the best to uh, you and the rest of the people in Berlin with that referendum. Let's hope we get the right outcome. So looking ahead to the European MMT conference in September, which people can attend online. Um, the subtitle of the conference is economic policy in a post-pandemic world. And um, I guess a part of what will determine how the post-pandemic world will unfold is whether or not governments who have just rediscovered that debt and deficit have no bearing on their ability to spend, <laughs> um, that, that will suddenly forget this lesson that they just relearned and start talking about paying down government debt and belt tightening and moving the agenda back to austerity. What's the weather looking like on that topic in Germany at the moment? Well, um, we have no talk about austerity on the on the federal level. Um, there's some talk about reintroducing the the debt break and so on. So the conservatives want to reintroduce it in 2024. I'm not sure whether the other parties. I think the other parties do not agree, or maybe they agree but say, "Well, let's make sure that it's not going to be reintroduced too early." But at the state level, um, there we do have a problem um, because we have also at the state level we have debt breaks breaks in Germany. So if you if you spend a little bit more, you can do that in an emergency, but you have to repay that the debt and um, the the time frame is given by the the constitution of the German state in in question. So some some German states say that you have to repay the debt um, over fifty years, for example. That of course is not a problem, but in in Saxony, I think in Saxony it says you have to you have to repay the debt in seven years, and that of course is is almost impossible. I mean that means you would have to generate very high surpluses, budget surpluses at the at the state level, and how will you do that? Um, so I, I guess there's only one possible uh, way out, which is to raise tax rates on the rich, because if you raise tax rates on the poor, they will they will spend less and then tax revenues will collapse anyway. If you cut government spending, it will lead to a collapse of tax revenues. We, we all know this. So it's, it's kind of a, a strange situation. 
um, that when you are, you are calling for, for budget surpluses, um, you, you can really do austerity. I mean, you, you can try it, but politically it will kill you. And the, the state governments, they don't want to be killed politically. So they know that the only way to, to get the, uh, their money back in, in a way, to get their, their level of debt, that go to make it go down to where it was before the pandemic is to raise taxes on the rich but i think they're lacking the the the, the right kind of instruments to do that um so we have income taxes in germany we have no wealth taxes and, and all of this is federal level but i think income taxes um actually they they go to the state in the end so income taxes go tax revenues go to the state but um i think the tax rates are set at the federal level so there's no there's no tax competition when it comes to income taxes so it's um, it's a very strange situation um, where clearly the the fiscal structure is is problematic, um, but nobody wants to touch it, especially not before the elections. Because if you if you would think about it, you would have to confirm the the things that MMT is always saying um, that you you cannot you cannot cut down government expenditure and expect to have a budget surplus. That's that's impossible. Uh, and the only way, again, the only way to to make tax revenues go up is to tax the rich. But that's politically impossible, at least with the government that we have now. Um, plus, it has to be decided at the federal level. So it's it's a strange situation. But I would say it's it's kind of relatively stable. So at least compared to the global financial crisis and then the following euro crisis, um, things are much better in Germany. And there's, there's very little talk about austerity. Is there a little talk about austerity when they at Germany level or at or at the EU level? No, I, I don't think. I mean, some governments like the Italian government or the Spanish government, you might think that they are afraid that the, the Germans will will introduce austerity rules again. But I would always say that that it would not be very effective because the one thing that the European Union regulates is the budget deficit. Okay, so so the total level of public debt it, it hardly makes any difference in the European fiscal compact. Don't don't let me explain what it is. I I don't think we have the time. Um, but there's a, a tiny clause in there that would allow you to have a, a budget deficit which is zero point five percent bigger if your public debt to GDP ratio is below sixty percent. Okay, so so yeah, deficits can be a little bit bigger if your public debt to GDP level is below sixty percent. But but that level for Italy was was one hundred and thirty before the crisis, so before the pandemic. Okay, so they they wouldn't even without the pandemic, they would not have fallen within this kind of range of of zero to sixty percent of GDP um, in the next couple of decades. So. It, so the public debt level doesn't doesn't make any difference. So the only way that that austerity policies could be brought back is to to say once again that the three percent uh, deficit uh, levels that they that constitutes a hard ceiling for the eurozone countries. But yeah, I I don't think that this is is problematic because if your if your economy is, is rebooting as we see this year, probably also your your tax revenues will be going up again, uh, and then you have less. Unemployed people, so government expenditures on the welfare system and social system are, are going down. So I would expect that that in an economy that is rebooting from from the shutdowns of 2020, you would see a budget surplus. Um, it, it would be the natural outcome of an economy which is which is rebooting. Um, so maybe it's it's still a budget deficit that is too high. So maybe you go from I don't know minus 12 percent last year to minus six percent this year. But then I think next year the stability and growth pact is off again, and then you, we would be talking about 2024. Okay, so I mean, in the 2010s, after austerity, most of the governments in the eurozone did have the budget surplus. So I think before, I think in 2019 there was only one country which did not have a public public budget surplus. Um, so it is, of course, a crazy proposition to have these countries running budget surpluses, um, but they, they had these surpluses before the crisis, and I don't think there would be a problem with, with having surpluses after the crisis if the economies go, go back to the level of aggregate demand that they had before the crisis. So even though MMT seems to be breaking through in policy circles in the US, 
Um, here in the UK, we've still got commentators who feel like monetary policy actually does something. And um, this week, the Times asserted now is the time to tighten monetary policy and keep a lid on inflation. Now, let's just put to one side that I think this morning, uh, the Evening Standard reported that actually inflation had uh, dropped off to 2% again. The suggestion uh, to Tighten monetary policy to keep a lid on inflation seems to me to be wrong in at least two ways. But uh, what's your take, Dirk? Uh, I would also say that if if you want to increase inflation, then of course you should raise interest rates. Yes, um, <laughs> that, that probably would be a good idea. Just for anybody that's newish to this, what why is that, Dirk? Well, if you increase the interest rates, that means that the government has to pay the bondholders more money because they pay more interest. So that's a transfer of of money. Or, or creation of money better. It's the creation of money that goes from the public sector to the private sector so they so that the pensioners or those holding the government bonds can spend more money. And then there's also the, the forward pricing channel. So if you can get 5%, for example, if the interest rate is 5% next year in the UK, you can get a risk-free 5% from, from your government by investing in government, government bonds. So other asset prices also have to have to deliver 5% interest rates. So so. Th- the most easiest way to do, deliver a 5% interest is that the price of, of something goes up by 5% so that you have an increase in your in your income from owning that asset. Um, so this is the MMT explanation. And historically, you can, you can see that normally uh, high interest rates go together with high rates of inflation, and then low interest rates go together with low rates of inflation. They think that's the response from the central bank to the inflation. They're, they don't read it the other way around, the way the way we see it, right? Yeah, I think they're learning, um, but they're not yet there. So they, they know that also something like uh, the change in unit labor costs has to do something with, with the rate of inflation. So, I mean, MMT stresses, for example, that if the government starts to, to pay uh, public workers, I don't know, 5% more, then probably the private sector will follow suit and they will then drive up the rate of inflation a little bit. If they go from, I don't know, 3% to 5%, there should be a higher inflation rate if the government just pays higher prices uh, and it can afford it. So the government is, is a, has a very strong influence on, on the rate of inflation and on the price level in, in general. And MMT has also stressed that um, often it's, it's just a couple of sectors where you have price increases and they, they drive the whole inflation rate. Um, so if prices in education go up, prices in the uh, medical sector, in the healthcare sector go up, um, that might drive your whole inflation rate. And then, of course, it might all be due to market structure. So it's just like some colleges and universities, they, they just charge 5% more every year. Um, and medicine, the price of medicines is increasing by 5% on average maybe every year because of monopoly powers that they're able to exploit because uh, of a lack of regulation maybe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if you want to look at the re- uh, inflation rate, you should get your hands dirty and, and look at the product prices and the groups of products which increase in price and, and think about uh, what has caused these price increases. Was it, I don't know, was it raw materials? So, I mean, the oil price going up is also a possibility for for an increase in the rate of inflation, but it might just be an increase in, in pricing power in the pharmaceutical sector, for example. So there's there's a million ways to address inflation. I don't think that, that any two inflations are the same, and MMT recognizes this. So just to sum all this up, and this is all from Warren's white paper, Warren's explanation of the source of the price level is that because a floating exchange rate currency is a monopoly, that currency's value against other things is determined by the prices paid for those things by the monopolist, which is the government. So if the government pays more for something today than it did yesterday, and then it keeps doing so, it's continuously revising the value of its currency downward. And then this is just my interpretation, but I wanted to check it with you guys. So a a situation where demand outstrips supply of certain things like, say, semiconductors, like we're seeing now, that will push some prices up. That's not quite inflation. Inflation is a continuous rise in all prices. But this becomes actual inflation when the government ratifies those price increases by paying those continuously high prices for the same things when the market demands those higher prices. Does that sound about right? 
Yeah, exactly. So one of the most important prices that the government pays is the, the price for, for its workers, so the wages for public employees. Um, so if, if, if those go up, then of course the government can create a higher rate of inflation. We should also not forget the, the tax rates. I mean, if you would decrease VAT, for example, then you would have a deflationary impulse. Um, if you increase VAT, you would have um, an inflationary impulse because all of the prices are going to go up. So I think that tax structure also plays a role. It's quite uh, interesting look, looking at the way, you know, the, the world has sort of responded to the pandemic and this, this is the supply side issues that are now emerging. And, and I saw a very interesting documentary on the whole kind of uh, Japanese Toyota type production where you have a just in time type of production where I don't know if you know how it works, Christian, but you basically just make make things to order. Uh, uh, and and that saves you having to produce too many things and having an inv a large inventory and because uh, that's costly and so that that was something that the west quickly copied from japan but apparently they copied it wrong <laughs> in the sense that they didn't allow for much resilience they they uh, and they assumed that this idea of of reducing inventory meant pretty much eliminating inventory, which meant that when you have an event like COVID now, you know, where you are switching everything off and then expecting everything to switch on back again pretty fast, you actually have things that don't can't quite keep up and, and there's there's blocks down the road. Um I don't know if you know much about that. I'm familiar with the just in time concept because I kind of think that's what they've done with, say, the NHS. They're always trying to cut the, the NHS, saying it's wasteful. To me, it's like, no, there needs to be capacity because something could happen, like a global pandemic. Yeah. To me, I compare it to the army. I'm sure there's a large part of our military system where people are just kind of ticking over, making sure that they're ready for an emergency, and that's not considered a waste. There are people exercising and making sure the equipment works, but not actually out there in combat. <laughs> you know, I think we need to be the same with, say, healthcare. You know, yeah. there needs to be a big buffer of capacity so that you know emergencies don't announce themselves a year before they happen <laughs> do you know what i mean but is this, this whole idea of resilience behind it being now kind of recognized at last as, a, as an important thing whereas before yeah. i feel like the whole focus was efficiency you know cut cost cut cost yeah now there is an idea of well what happens if we run out of food you know and and not just because of brexit but you know because of anything so are you saying that the the japanese just in time model had a bit more of a buffer in built into it yeah i think i think they recognized that as you mentioned that you know semiconductors were were dif more dif difficult to to acquire uh, now, for example, and I think what they recognize is that there were some parts of their production line that weren't easily kind of done to order. So they did they did need to stockpile a, a certain amount of the most kind of difficult to source items, or, or the ones that were at most risk of of uh, of having shortages or more, or that the production was more sensitive to. And I think that's something that the West maybe when when they you know they saw this system they didn't quite catch that side of things and they just said oh well just cut you know just cut all inventory because inventory is cost you know you're paying for warehouses and all this and, and yeah that that made funny enough that made our economies a lot more um, fragile. Well, I just find it so hard to believe that w we Brits could mess something up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just us, though. I mean, it's, it's the whole of Europe, right? Do they do this in Germany? I think we, we missed out on, on these technologies. So there was, like the, some decades ago, semiconductor production um, and also these, the other chips and, and electronical parts. But, but all of this now comes from Asia, uh, all, almost all of this. And how is it produced? Well, it's, it's basically factories full of robots and there's maybe six people working there, um, and they have to be ultra clean because any any grain of of, of whatever would mess up the whole production run. Um, so um, you you cannot you cannot increase production in one of these factories because it's just robots, and the robots are working in their robot style at the at their robot speed, and and that's <laughs> going to be the maximum speed that that will make 
production possible. You um, can't so give you, robots incentives. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly my point. So you can you can tell the robots, okay, go faster now. We need more stuff. <laughs> they won't they won't complain to the union, uh, but they also won't work faster. And if if you want to if you want to increase production, then well, you have to build a whole new factory. Uh, and that's that. That is the kind of lumpiness that is that is always, always um, a big problem for economists. <laughs> that reality is lumpy. Okay, so you cannot say I want more of this, like ten percent more, um, because well, if if your factory is at at one hundred percent productivity, if you produce everything that you can produce, then of course there, there's no way that you can make those robots go faster. So so that's why I said you have to build a new factory. And apparently the Asian ship producers they they misunderstood or they misread the demand situation. Okay, they they thought that maybe there will be a prolonged uh, slump. And they said, okay, n- let's not risk anything. So let's 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 scale production down. And then they, when they rebooted their their systems, they they produced what they produced before the crisis. And then there was more demand. But of course, if if there's more demand, well, where are those computer chips coming from? Well, from new factories. But to build one of the new factories, it takes two or three years probably. Um, so I think that the market, in, in a sense, will work. Those high prices will give an incentive to to build another factory, uh, and that means you have to build all these robots again, and that it just takes a lot of of time. And I would therefore expect that we see these kind of price movements in all sorts of of stuff. We will see those for for maybe a couple of years more, maybe until twenty twenty five, and then the situation will will have sorted itself out. Or we we have some kind of new crisis before that happens, so we'll see. It depends on whether we can hold back the the people who are crazy for uh, for interest rate increases, right? Yeah, also the financial markets are. I mean, they are sky high. So I think a financial crisis is still in the cards. I mean, the central banks have said, let's not do anything. Let's just watch. We stand on the sidelines and watch what the inflation thing is is going is doing to us. Mm-hmm. Um, but. If we go back to to something like full capacity and something like full employment, I mean, we, we're not there. Um, but the US in the US, you can see bottlenecks and workers getting good deals. Um, and at some point, if the central banks continue to misread the monetary policy situation, they will stay say once again, let's start raise, let's start to raise interest rates because we think we can fight inflation with this. Um, which they can through a, a high unemployment, which is not a good idea, but but it, it works if you if you collapse private investment. And I mean, higher interest rates at some point do collapse. Uh, well, I mean, they, they might collapse private investment. Let's put it like this. But then the next crisis m- m- might be coming up because if you if you increase interest rates in a couple of countries like the US and maybe the UK, maybe something happens to all these supposedly uh, supposed online on, and digital currencies. Um, so, so they don't offer interest rates. So in a zero interest rate, it's nice to have some kind of, of digital coin, which, which also pays no interest rate. Um, but in a world where you have significant levels of interest rates, so you have like five or even, even more than 5%, why would you want to hold some kind of digital coin which pays you zero. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. That can create then the next crisis. Well, it always starts with the US raising interest rates, these crises, don't they? So Yeah, they used to. It seems to me that that you know enough people in policy circles in the UK and the US are saying this is bottlenecks rather than you know, this is um, you, you know the beginning of Weimar style inflation hyperinflation and we've got to we've got to get ahead of it. It seems to me that the cooler heads are prevailing at the moment, but like you say, if they finally decide, okay, we we need to. Um, preempt inflation if they're still working with the their ideas of how interest rates work yeah we're we're in for a rough time yeah definitely so we need we need more people to understand mmt so yes. yeah all <laughs> out there, please support this podcast <laughs> <laughs> so so turning to the panels on the second day of the conference uh one topic under discussion is aggregate demand management in the eurozone so for anybody new to these terms could you say what we mean by aggregate demand and demand management Dirk? yeah so aggregate demand is is just the amount of of money that is spent on on goods and services and inside one one of the economy and uh, of course in the eurozone there's there's this problem that 
before we had the euro, um, it was very clear that the national government would be responsible for the unemployment uh, problem. So if there's lots of unemployment in your country, well, you ask the government to spend more money. And if they don't do it, you vote for another party which promises to spend more money and solve the unemployment problem. And that worked well enough for most countries. Um, let's not forget that countries like Spain had a 20% unemployment rate in the early 1990s when they had the peseta. Um, but let's just say that it worked well enough for, for most of the countries most of the time. Um, but now we have this problem that in terms of macroeconomic management, people have nobody to turn to. So the, if they ask the national government, they will say, well, sorry, we have those deficit limits, so we're not allowed to increase spending um, because that will produce bigger deficits and then the troika will come and ask us to to stop doing this. Of course, right now you have the, the stability and growth pact, which is more or less deactivated by an escape clause. Um, so, so right now those Eurozone countries uh, do not have an excuse. They can just spend more money. Uh, the Spanish government did, and also in Italy, Draghi's government uh, also increased government spending quite significantly. Um, but of course, this will not probably not last uh, for may, maybe lasts in, until two thousand and twenty three. So next, well, two more years, uh, but then we'll revert to normal. So that means that in in normal times, so with the stability and growth pact in place. Then, of course, you cannot ask your national government to, to help fight the unemployment problem, but you can also not ask the European Commission because it's way too small. So the budget of the European Commission is about 1% of GDP. So if they increase their spending by 10%, you would hardly notice that anywhere in the Eurozone. So we have this political problem. What do we do? I mean, we could stay in a world like, like we have today um, and say, okay, the, the deficit limits have to go. So just ask your national government to pursue full employment and forget about the deficit limits. Um, that's one possibility. I guess that returning to the stability and growth pact with those deficit limits is really not an option. So even people, high-ranking people in Brussels um, are saying that, that they don't want to go there. And they think that it will be a disaster if they return to this. So I think that I mean it, it has it uh, it took probably ten years or so, but there there apparently has been a major rethink in in Brussels. Um, but I mean it's it's in the end it's about political power. So um, it's it's good that people in Brussels apparently understand now that the stability and growth pact with these deficit limits is a problem. Um, but the question now is is who will who will have the power i mean it will be the german government i guess who will have the, who would have the power to change something but we don't know who will will be so in september we have elections here in germany and we'll we'll have to wait and see what happens i mean the last government which was the the christian democrat social democrat coalition uh, they they wanted to 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 do something about europe um and in the in, in the end they didn't so let's see what happens in september i think that's what the panel is about, roughly. I'm just curious, uh, what is the argument against just doing away with that element of the stability and growth pact, the 3% um, debt limit, I guess, as it's a debt to GDP ratio, right? Yeah. Well, I, I guess it's just a political thing. So so many people build their careers on these kind of rules and this kind of talk. So they know all the talk that only surrounds austerity. So they, they talk about fiscal responsibility. They talk about um, public debt getting out of hand uh, and public debt being a burden to the next generation. So they know they know all this talk and they don't want to see that go. So I guess this is how political coalitions build around certain certain ideas. They might seem stupid from the outside. I mean, if, if you're an economist um, with an open mind, you would probably say, why would you want to have a 3% uh, deficit limit? And there's, there's even worse cases. So, for example, the Swedish government, which has its own currency, that Swedish government is forced to run a 1% surplus, budget surplus every year in normal times. Okay, so that's even worse. <laughs> so, so if you can go bankrupt, why would you want to have a budget surplus of the government? And yeah, but but and and you would think that Sweden is a social democratic uh, country and, and all of that, and they have a big welfare state, but they have this budget rule. So, so you can ask yourself, would you would you rather want to live in I don't know Belgium, and have the deficit rule of the European Union, which is three percent deficit, or you want to live in Sweden, where they have their own currency but they have to have a one percent surplus in in the government's budget? Um, so, I think the, the 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 thing to blame here for the mismanagement of the currency is the deficit rule or the surplus rule in as in Sweden. 
um, but not the currency itself. So I wouldn't say that, for example, the, the Swedish krona is not working for the Swedes or something. Um, but of course, in the eurozone, it's it's a bit different because in the eurozone you have a very very different levels of of income and and also of development. So in the eurozone, um, the the problems that that come up with these deficit rules they are much stronger than than they are in Sweden, for example. If a person understands MMT and um, that the issuer of currency can't run out of currency and debt denominated in a currency that you issue isn't really debt, it's just you swapping non-interest bearing euros for interest bearing euros. People who understand that kind of stuff, if you get them to understand that and they're okay with debt, (laughs) <laughs> and therefore they might be okay with suspending these arbitrary rules like the 3% limit are there any real concerns that suspending that rule would uh, create a, a situation i guess our the thing that we consider to be a real concern is inflation that can be the only possible negative outcome of um, a government quote unquote overspending inflation can come from many other places but that's you know rather than default Inflation is the thing we've got to look for. Is there anything to say about that uh, regarding suspending the Growth and Stability Pact? Well, I mean, the Growth and Stability Pact, um, well, actually, it's the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, sorry. That sorry, was kind yes. of, yeah, never mind. <laughs> um, that was a, that has been a, def, that, that has had a deflationary influence on, on the whole Eurozone. So, hmm. so in, in good times, maybe wages are rising a little bit, but in bad times, you have all these cuts of public workers' wages and you have austerity and, and all these things. So, so politicians now have this austerity mindset. Okay. So, so they are afraid of deficits and debts. And, to have these people create a situation in which they cause, through their increases in government spending, an inflation rate which is unacceptable, I think that can't happen inside the 2020s. It's impossible. Okay, so I, I call this the, the idea of the macroeconomic mindset. And you you still have these, these public bureaucrats and these politicians who have this austerity mindset. They, they, are, they are in very high places. Um, and... I, I don't think that in terms of politics, you can move all these people out of power and then have new MMT educated people enter those, those places, uh, and then, then switch on the lever and, and, or, or turn the lever and then, I don't know, government spending increases and you have lots of inflation. I, I don't think that it will happen like this. So, so I, I think that if you would take away the stability and growth pack and just say, well, forget about those deficit limits. And that's all you say. I, I think that would be that would be okay. I mean, just look at the eurozone right now. I mean, the, the stability and growth pact is off. It's turned off right now. There's no punishment for high deficits, but the countries are not overspending. They're definitely not overspending. Okay, so because they still have this macroeconomic mindset from the austerity policies, so that is why I would think that taking away the stability and growth pact might be a good idea, and then later on. So if in 2030 and in 2035, for example, we have high rates of inflation in the Eurozone and we price ourselves out of the market and the UK gains in competitiveness, <laughs> okay, if, if these kind of troubles should arise ever, um, then of course you, you can, you can think about these kind of problems. So I, I think MMT, because it is not a neoclassical tradition, we, we don't think about the real world in terms of equilibrium, okay? So we don't want to reach this kind of nirvana position where, where nothing will change anymore and we, are, we live in a perfect world. But I would say, um, let's look at the institutions, let, let's look at our problems, and then we change the institutions to address those problems that we have today. And if we get different problems because we are doing that in the future, um, then let's address those future problems when, when they arise. Um, and... That is why in the Eurozone, I, I do believe that getting rid of the stability and growth pact's deficit limits would, would be a very, very good idea. Um, and uh, it, would, it will not harm us. So the, the, the backlash will, will, will not be there, I guess, in terms of, of inflation getting out of control. I think the fact that, the, like you say, Dirk, the, um, the stability and growth pact is turned off now and the sky's not falling in i think the longer that goes on the stronger the case gets for just scrapping it 
Yeah, and I mean, it's um, it can be a phasing out. I mean, the the European Commission, which is, as I said, it's a com- it's a commission. It's not the European government, uh, but but the Commission can can just decide not to enforce the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact. So I I think that was in two thousand fourteen that the Spanish and the Portuguese governments uh, they they were above their deficit limits. They they had. I think they had agreed with the European Commission to have, is, I don't know, to have an, a deficit which is higher than three percent, but lower than than some other arbitrary number, and they missed those deficit limits, and they should have been punished in 2014 by the European Commission, but the European Commission just looked into it and basically thought, oh, okay, you have conservative governments in both Spain and in Portugal, and there will be upcoming elections, so let's not enforce the rules, okay? So. So politics is a, is a dirty game. I mean, you can just you can just say, okay, there's rules, and officially we we enforce the rules. But then, of course, when you kind of realize that enforcing the rules means that politically you you get into problems, you get into trouble, then of course you can decide not to enforce those rules. And that's that's how things are are coming apart in terms of the stability and growth pact. I guess they, I mean, as you said, we will just recognize in the eurozone. That not enforcing those deficit limits uh, in the pandemic was a very good idea. Okay, so I mean, look at what happened to Greece in the eurozone crisis in 2010. Okay, so their their government bond prices collapsed, and then they they they, they lost access to the to the banks, which were buying up the the government bonds from Greece, and then they stopped doing that, and then they 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 couldn't bring their account at the Greek Central Bank back to zero, which meant that the Greek Central Bank could not make the payments anymore for the Greek government. All of this did not happen in 2020 and 2021. So mm-hmm. so it's mm-hmm. kind of clear that, that this was a superior solution. So since Draghi uh, came on board at the ECB, um, the ECB understood that it has to be I call this the dealer of last resort normally as it has to be the dealer of last resort for government bonds. Because by by being the dealer of last resort, they guarantee that the price of those bonds will be stable and high, and that the governments, the national governments, will not lose access to to their spending. So the central banks, the national central banks, will will always continue to spend for them, as long as those national governments can can sell government bonds. And I think we we have recognized this, and and in the eurozone, this was. I mean, the the Greek government bonds are are, are very popular now by investors. Uh, they, they 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 buy them. Billions of them, uh, and and it's it's a completely different game, and and almost everybody la- likes this game. And there's, I mean, because it is a pandemic, there's nobody there's nobody to blame. Okay, so um, the German government doesn't doesn't need to blame any other European government for for the pandemic. Um, it could not be justified. So so I think that politically we are living in a different world in 2021 compared to the global financial crisis, um, and and that is probably why. After after learning also from the last crisis, I mean the stability and growth pact that did not have an escape clause um, during the two thousand eight two thousand nine global financial crisis. So those deficit limits had had to be enforced, uh, and they these kind of backdoors were only built in. In I think it was probably in two thousand fourteen there was a revision of some of the European uh, treaties. What is the wording on that uh, escape clause, just vaguely? Okay, vaguely it says that in, in times of economic emergency, um, you can activate the escape clause, and then the stability and growth pact is basically turned off um, until it is turned turned on again. And I think that you kind of you turn it off for a couple of years, and then it kind of automatically goes on again. Um, that's that's how it works. Does every uh, eurozone member nation have to agree that it's an emergency? You know, who who decides whether it's an emergency or not? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I think that the the European Council, um, which is this kind of uh, not very well known uh, <laughs> institution <laughs> that sits at the top of of the European Union institutions, so the European Council has to propose this, and then the European Commission has to has to vote on this. I guess. So when the European Commission says 
stability and growth pact act, uh, escape clause is activated that that is one when when that happens and the european council has to has to make the proposal to do just that that's the official way way to do this so it's very undemocratic so the european parliament has no say in it but i mean functionally it has worked this time and it didn't work the last time so i mean the eurozone would not have had suffer, had to suffer this austerity uh, drama uh, or tragedy um, that it suffered in 2010 if, if we would have had these, this general escape clause and stability and growth back. So I would say that at the European institutions, it's still everything is still very neoliberal, but at least uh, this time um, we were able to, to, to create Keynesian solutions or MMT kind of solutions um, to the problems that, that came up. So I, I do think there's some kind of rethinking going on at the European level, which is is very slow and a lot of countries are hurt and it kind of comes too late for them. So, I mean, unemployment in Greece is still at a disastrously high level. Same with youth unemployment in Spain or Italy. So so we still have lots of problems with the lack of demand and, and high rates of unemployment. Um, but, I mean, the, the Eurozone could have collapsed um, easily if, if they would not have changed the the treaties and and now i mean looking forward um either we learn and and say say um okay um deficits should be off forever um or we we might say okay maybe the rules don't work for all and and let's think about moving one or two countries out of the eurozone if they say it's it's not a fit um but it's it's gonna be yeah i mean you can see with brexit what's going on i mean these problems that you get and it's not even, I mean, you had the UK pound before and you, you keep it. But I mean, just exiting the European Union, for example, it's uh, it's creating a big mess. Oh, I thought it was going swimmingly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to just go out on a positive note, the, uh, the Green New Deal will be under discussion. And uh, apologies, there's a big question, but let's swing for the fences. Tell us, Dirk, what you think a Europe fully committed to a Green New Deal would look like? How would people be living? First of all, I would like to say that the Green New Deal that that, that at least I envision um, and that others envision is not something like a, a top-down kind of thing, which is driven by the Brussels bureaucracy. But we imagine the Green New Deal, which is which is funded um, at this at a federal level. Um, so either you can use the, the ECB. I mean, the ECB can create money, right? I mean, they can create reserves. And it doesn't cost them anything, and there, there's no limit. So you can create something like, um, like maybe a special accounts uh, to spend from, or you can have the European Investment Bank issue more green bonds. They already do this. So if the ECB then says we, we would buy up those green bonds, if their price um, is, is I, I don't know too low, and they would act, act as a market maker there, then of course you could finance everything through the European Investment Bank. Um, and then I would give the money to those at the local level, if possible. And if it doesn't make sense at the local level, then you give it to, to people at the regional level, then the state level, and then at the very end, the, the European level. So I, I think that would be nice because you could, you would strengthen democracy. So because you are spending at the local level, people would see, see that there's extra money. Okay. And they would see, okay, so here's the mission. We have to do this and that. So CO2 zero, we, we have to reach that kind of target. We have to get rid of this and that. And we have to have more public transport and we will have to, to rezone inside the city. So maybe we need more green spaces and less, less roads, for example. Um, so this is what I imagine that, that people can decide on the local level what they want to do with, with the money and the resources that they have, uh, in order to, to move us to a sustainable uh, economy. There are some problems that we can only tackle at the at the European level, for example, at the federal level sometimes. I mean, thinking about high-speed uh, rail networks, for example, that cannot be decided uh, on the local level. It doesn't make sense for, for cities and villages to spend money on high-speed trains. So, so you have to think about the European solution to this kind of, of high-speed na rail networks to replace um, these these intra-European flights that we that we still have, but that we probably cannot cannot afford to have in in the future. So the Green New Deal would allow people to to decide their own fate, and it would create lots of employment, lots of good jobs. We could also have a, a job guarantee, which is also then funded maybe by Brussels, so that if there's people who are still looking for work and can find work, 
then they also have somewhere to go and, and find a job on a local level and, and yeah, keep their skills, keep their knowledge and, and be able to, to transition back into the normal labor market when, when aggregate demand picks up again. So I, I think that the Green New Deal can be re a really positive policy um, because it can empower European citizens and, and, and yeah, help them to, to change their surrounding areas. I mean, that's, that's really revolutionary. One important thing that maybe we could just just underline before we go, which is, you know, I always say, you know, the, the job guarantee isn't the Green New Deal, but it's a very important part of it. The reason why we would we want that buffer stock, that liquid buffer stock of people in the job guarantee to be ideally as small as possible, really, because that that would reflect a, a healthy economy that, that, that uh, you know, mo most people are in other types of work. Yeah, but I mean, with the Green New Deal, I mean, this it's impossible to to get it right so that you create full employment um, to the last person. Um, so the Green New Deal makes sure that those, I mean, people will be scared of, uh, about the future and about the transition, and and there will be new stuff, and also maybe maybe people will not be able to to use their cars as as they did in the past because it will be very expensive, um, and maybe there will be new rules. For, I don't know, maybe. It's not possible to use a car to to commute to to faraway places. Um, maybe people can only have two flights a year or something like this, or or maybe train travel only. Um, so it, it would be very good to make sure that, that at least nobody is is unemployed because of the Green New Deal. Um, so that otherwise you would have people who are very frustrated and then they blame it all on on I don't know government or. Or the Green New Deal, and then they 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 organize ex extremist stuff and and go against the Green New Deal. So it's important that we do this together. One of the main reasons people use their car um, to travel is to go to work every day because they don't live where they work, and in a sense, making jobs available um, within within their the place where people actually live might you know help make that. As you say, that that sort of lifestyle adjustment a lot easier in the U.S. For example, they don't even have much in terms of trains <laughs> anyway, so they'd have to get working on that really quickly. Yeah, I mean the U.S. situation is is very bad compared to the situation in Europe. I mean we have smaller cars. We normally have have more public infrastructure in terms of public transport on the local level also, and then we have these these train connections which are international. Um, so that's that's something which is going to help us to to uh, uh, yeah to to keep keep up our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it. We've been speaking with Dr. Dirk Entz, author of Modern Monetary Theory and European Macroeconomics, but even more importantly, convener of the 2021 European MMT Conference, which can be attended online in real time from wherever you are in the world. The speakers are great. The topics under discussion couldn't be more urgent. And you can find links to all of the information about the conference in the show notes for this episode. But for now, thank you so much for joining us today on the MMT Podcast, Dr. Dirk Entz. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.